Okay, I want to assure you that I try to be as objective as possible in this video, but I'm sure you can understand that when analyzing a creative network like this, it's hard to do so. Just realize this is not an opinion piece, but my own opinions do influence the video more than usual. I should tell you right away that I used to be one of the biggest Nickelodeon fans that you'll ever see. I was born in 1991. So I'd say from 1994 through 2004, I watched everything that they had to offer. Double Dare, Rugrats, all that, are you afraid of the dark? I used to get so scared watching that. If you had asked me to list my top 10 favorite shows, at least eight of those would have come from Nickelodeon. You remember that show The Brothers Garcia? I used to hate when that came on, but for some reason, nine-year-old me would never miss an episode. Nickelodeon goes way back to the early 1900s. The word Nickelodeon is a combination of the word nickel, which is how much they would charge for admission, and Odeon, which is the Greek word for theater. By the 1910s, there were thousands of them across the United States, and people were starting to see the potential of the industry. The movies and the theaters started getting bigger and better and more expensive. Let's skip ahead 60 or 70 years to April 1, 1979 when Warner launched a new television channel called Nickelodeon as the first network for kids. I realized the name doesn't seem to have any connection until you see their original theme introducing children's programming fit for children. Maybe things were different back then, but I would never expect this early 1900s theme to be appealing to children. It just doesn't seem fitting. Plus, considering they didn't show old movies or shows, it just doesn't fit me. They got that same impression because after a couple of years, they dropped it and brought in some more color. But through all of this, nothing was really happening. They did have a hit show called You Can't Do That on television, sort of a sketch comedy thing. No, you wouldn't know it from watching the networks, but Nickelodeon has been closely tied to MTV. In fact, in 1984, MTV and Nickelodeon were brought together into a division called MTV Networks. On January 1, 1985, VH1 was created and added to that division nine months later. All three of them were sold to Viacom. There was a deal valued over $600 million and also included half of Showtime. They already owned the other half. I want to express how insignificant Nickelodeon was to this deal. When CNN reported on it, their headline was Viacom buys MTV no mention of Nickelodeon. They only bring it up once halfway through the article when they finally say that they also produce Nickelodeon. But the real prize here is MTV. As far as basic cable network rankings, Nickelodeon went from last place in 1985 to first place by 1995. Let's take a look at how they did it. For one, they looked at some of the successful aspects of MTV and applied them to Nickelodeon, mainly the graphics. MTV used to have all these crazy colorful animations and graphics. It sent a cool, modern vibe, and they were kind of known for it. So they figured this would be perfect for our kids' network. For the second half of the 1980s, they introduced everything that I associate with the network. I'm talking all these wild animations with the color orange everywhere, the iconic Splat logo, and more importantly, they also introduced Nick at Night which was just a bunch of old sitcoms that they would air later in the day when all the kids were asleep. Of all their changes in the network, I would say that the most important one came in 1991 when they introduced Nicktoons. You probably know that it's more expensive to produce cartoons as opposed to live-action shows, but Viacom was finally able to invest, and plus, it's kind of strange having a network for kids without cartoons, isn't it? So I imagine that they saw this as being almost essential. In August of that year, they they introduced their first three cartoons. There were Ran and Stimpy, Rugrats, and Doug. I'd say that's a pretty incredible start. All three are fought to be classics today. And really, I would consider just about any cartoon they made in the 90s to be a classic. We have Rocco's Modern Life, Ah, uh, Real Monsters, Hey Arnold, Cablum, The Angry Beavers, Cat Dog, the Wild Foreign Berries, Rocket Power, even a few of their later shows too, Invader Zim, The Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, and it wasn't all Nicktoons. What about all this live-action stuff? In 1990, they opened Nickelodeon Studios where they filmed all sorts of live-action shows. Notably, Clarissa Explains It All, 
all that Keenan and Kel, and not to mention all the wacky game shows like Double Dare and Figure It Out. In 1994, Viacom spent $8 billion to buy the majority stake of the film studio Paramount Pictures. They started putting that synergy to work when they teamed up to create Nickelodeon movies. Their first release was Harriet the Spy in 1996, followed by Good Burger the following year, the Rugrats movie the year after that. Again, all classics in my opinion. Now I know everyone wants to hear about what happened to Nickelodeon, what went wrong, and why are they so bad now? The title of my website says Nickelodeon, Rise and Fall, but I have to be honest, I don't have perfect answers as to why they fell, nor am I completely convinced of this fall. So instead of trying to make these arguments, I prefer to just talk about what's been going on. Nickelodeon is still owned by Viacom, which at this point, I'm sure you realize, they have a lot more going on. And since they don't separately report figures for Nickelodeon, it makes it difficult to see how the network's been doing. However, they have been reporting how many subscribers they have from 1993 all the way to 2016. Looking at this graph, you may be quick to draw conclusions and say, right about 2010, Nickelodeon went bad, and they've been declining ever since. I would address that by saying, Netflix and YouTube have really grown over that time, especially with kids, and have caused people to cancel their entire cable package. There's this whole cord-cutting movement, and you can expect to see a similar graph for most cable channels, with their peak being right around 2010, and as recent as 2015, at their SEC reports, claimed that they've held on to that number one basic cable spot every year since 1995. So yes, Nickelodeon is declining in this aspect but I wouldn't really say it's their fault. Another argument you can make is, what about Nickelodeon Studios? You know after every show, they would always have that shot of it with the green fountain and frame. I always wanted to go there, and now I'm sad to say that I never will because they shut it down in 2005, which I know sounds like a bad sign, but they shut it down because the network shifted away from those game shows and the live action stuff that required a studio audience. A big argument going around is Nickelodeon has gotten late Easy. SpongeBob premiered in 1999, evidently on my birthday. It was a big hit, and they've since become far too reliant on it. The creativity is gone, and they're spending all their efforts on what they know already works and are too reluctant to take any chances on something new. I mean, just looking at the Nickelodeon schedule, about half of their time slots are occupied by SpongeBob. I'm not going to dispute this one too much because I think there's some truth to it, but I will point out that there's been some pretty respected shows to premiere since 1999. We have Invader Sim, The Fairly Odd Parents in 2001, Jimmy Neutron in 2002, Drake and Josh in 2004, Zoe 101 in Avatar, The Last Airbender in 2005, iCarly in 2007. It's not a complete list, but I think you get the idea. Still, over time, it does look like this approach has hindered their creativity. I think most would agree that the Nicktoons aren't what they used to be. They certainly don't focus on them like they used to. I look at this list of Nickelodeon shows, and in my opinion, they start to get bad right around 2004. Drake and Josh I always liked, and that's probably the last one. Then I look at the more recent stuff, and I don't even know what it is. The Thundermans, Game Shakers, Sanjay and Craig. I've lost touch with Nickelodeon, and that raises a question that maybe we should all ask ourselves. Did the shows really get lazy and worse over the years, or have I just seen them differently as I've gotten older? For many kids around the world, including me, Nickelodeon was once something magical. Sure, maybe they've gotten lazy and lost touch with their audience, but I'd argue that with YouTube and all the other on-demand platforms, video games, we now live in a time where it's impossible to capture that same magic through a TV network. Disney does seem to be able to do it, but look how much it takes. I know I'm all over the place here, so let me summarize. The subscription numbers are down, the famous Nickelodeon studios are closed forever, and the shows just aren't what they used to be. But I think that creates a narrative that sounds much worse than it actually is. Maybe they're different, maybe we're different. Let's face it, it's probably a combination of both. Let me know in the comments, what do you think happened to Nickelodeon? I asked the question, but I don't know who can really answer it. I encourage everyone else to share the same thing. What were your favorite Nickelodeon shows? What were your least favorite? When did you stop watching? Or are you still watching? I'd like to hear what you have to say. Me and SpongeBob have the same birthday. All right, thank you for watching.